I've been doing this kind of study recently, and I thought, well, why not, since I've got to do this, and I wasn't really preparing for this particular approach, or at least this particular study, but certainly any preacher of the gospel ought to be able to preach on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I thought I would approach this from the standpoint that's a little bit different. Now, everything that you just heard in this last sermon, as far as what was having to do with the Bible and those illustrations given, are certainly true. But if Jesus Christ of Nazareth has not been raised from the dead, there's nothing worth anything and nothing amounts to anything. Amen. And you'll remember that Jesus said that I am the resurrection of the life. Now he said that when he came after having hearing that Lazarus was ill. We learn later in the text he deliberately waited until he died. Because he wanted this to be a great proof. And as a proof, great encouragement and strength to those that would hear about this. And when we come down to John chapter 11, verse 23, Jesus saith unto her, Martha that is, Thy brother shall rise again. Now right here in her response we learn something about the state of the Jews. These are devout Jews. They're not hypocrites. Lazarus and Mary and Martha were devoted to doing all they could to live like the law of Moses told them to do. And we learn something about what the Jews believe just by her statement. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. They all believed in the general resurrection. They didn't understand, and that's one reason we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and read about uh, the apostles, how they had such a difficulty understanding when Christ would indicate He was going to rise from the dead. Because they had no understanding of an individual resurrection of a person while all other folks were alive on this earth, especially never to die again. And that's the key to it. Other people have been raised from the dead. He was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is going to have to die again. But he said then to her, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever, that's as broad as the human race, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So he's saying, do you believe this? And what he's about to give her is proof for her to be able to believe what he just said. Because in just a moment, he's going to ask, where have you laid him? That is, dead Lazarus. Then he's going to say, take away the stone in verse 39. And then he's going to say in verse 40, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. In this case, Lazarus is going to be raised from the dead. And then he prayed to his father. And then he simply says, Lazarus, come forth. No jumping up and down, no screaming, no slashing, no wallowing on the floor, no anything. The power of the Word of God from the executor of the Father's will who brought all things into existence by the Word of His power spoke. And one particular person out of all of the thousands in the Hadean world came back to the body and arose. You wonder why people died for the cause of Christ? Well, this is just the beginning. I'm going to deal this evening with the historical evidence for the resurrection of Christ. I'm going to approach this like a historian. I'm going to approach it without necessarily saying this is the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, complete revelation of God to man. That is the Bible. I believe as much as anybody, 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, I believe the Word of God is just that, the Word of God, revealed from God by the Holy Spirit, set down by the inspired writer. But we're also taught in this Word of God, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. I'm interested this evening 
in the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you it is exceedingly good. Scholars such as uh, William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Gary Habermas, and many others, if you read their works and look into them, they have done especially good jobs of detailing this evidence. I'm interested in evidence. It was mentioned a while ago in the sermon that this world we live in is more heathen every day that the sun rises. And besides those who just don't care, and you couldn't persuade them no matter what, because the attitude is eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. But for those who are interested, there's just a lot of folks who say you're just another religion. What is it to Christ, or what is it to Muhammad, uh, and all of that? Well, there's a way to approach. And even the higher critics, those we call the skeptics, admit many of these things. And there's a reason why. They can't deny the evidence. These documents are historical documents from antiquity. They are just as historical as any of the ancient writers of history. Herodotus, the Greek historian, all those things he wrote. People all around will tell you, yes, those things actually happened. And that goes back further than 2,000 years ago. So I want us to note a method that's used today to determine historicity in an event. And it's really called inference to the best explanation. It has been described as an approach where we begin with the evidence available to us. Now listen. And then we infer what would, if true, provide the best explanation of that evidence. In other words, we ought to accept an event as historical if it gives the best explanation for the evidence surrounding it. Now let me ask you a question. Is that not the case with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Did He leave us without credible evidence? Must we just wonder and have to have some sort of warm feeling move up our spine before we say, that's right, that's right. No, it's not anything like that. When we look at the evidence, the truth of the resurrection emerges very clearly as the best explanation for the evidence that has come down to us. There is solid historical grounds for the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And the skeptics who are scholars, but they don't accept the Bible as the Word of God, but they approach it as a historically accurate book, can't deny these things. And what's been amazing since about World War II, they have quit trying to deny it because the evidence is too overwhelming. Now, I don't think that doesn't put them on the spot because it does, which we shall know more later. We're going to focus on three truths that even these skeptics or these critical scholars admit. In other words, these three truths are so strong that they are even accepted by serious historians of all kinds of stripes. These truths are, number one, the tomb in which Jesus Christ was buried was discovered empty by a group of women on the first day of the week following the crucifixion. That's the first one. Number two, Jesus' disciples had real experiences with one whom they believed was the risen Christ. And number three, as a result of the preaching of these disciples, which you'll remember had the resurrection of Christ at its very center and core, the church of Christ was established and grew. As I said in the beginning, you take the resurrection of Christ, away from the gospel of Christ, and what have ye more than others? Nearly all scholars who deal with the resurrection, as I said earlier, whatever their stripe or their school of thought, assent to these three truths. Now, if you haven't read after these folks, you just have to take my word for it till you decide to take time to read after them. When these facts are taken together, not only just taken one by one, one, two, three, but when they're taken together, we have an even more powerful case for the resurrection. 
because the skeptic will not have to explain away or attempt to explain away just one historical fact. And notice I say historical fact, but three of them. First of all, let's look at the empty tomb. What is the evidence? I underscore that word evidence. Remember, prove all things, hold fast, that which is good. What's the evidence that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was discovered empty by some women on the first day of the week following the crucifixion of Christ? First, the resurrection was preached in the same city where Jesus had died and was buried shortly thereafter. The disciples didn't go way over back somewhere in an obscure place where nobody ever heard of Jesus to begin preaching about the resurrection. They started right there in Jerusalem where all of those events of which we read of in the last week, what's called sometimes the Passion Week of Christ, took place. After th over three years of every day going about doing good, and then all those events that led up to the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ, they go right to the very core of those who put Him to death. Now with that in mind, sometimes go back and read Acts 2. And how bold it was that Peter, as well as the other apostles, would declare to that audience on that Pentecost day, Ye have taken, and with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. Then immediately he launches into proof of the very resurrection of Christ. We ought to think about that. And there's not a skeptic to get around that. Because Luke is definitely writing in Acts a book of antiquity. Did he lie? And if he did, how are you going to prove it? <coughs> Everything speaks to the fact he wrote the truth. They could not have done this if Jesus was still in his tomb. No one would have believed them. They just had to point over there to the tomb and say, go over there, rock's still in front of it, the body's still there. That would have ruined the whole thing from the beginning. Second, the earliest Jewish arguments against Christianity, believe it or not, is that they admit the empty tomb. Now, I want you to think about that a while. There's a reason inspiration put that in the Bible. In Matthew 28, 11 through 15, there is a reference made to their attempt, the Jews, to refute Christianity by saying that the disciples stole the body. Now, why is that significant? Why is it very important? Because it shows that the Jews did not deny the empty tomb. Now, it was to their benefit to say it wasn't empty. They couldn't do it. They said somebody stole the body. But it's a theory that admits to the significant truth that the tomb was, was empty. They just soon did not be empty. If you read a little extra biblical literature, later on you'll find out the Jews continued to make this argument as to what happened to the body. That the disciples stole it. But that admits to its emptiness. Now, again, why is this important? If you were in a court of law and you were to have the Jewish leaders as witnesses, they would not be friendly witnesses. Not at all. They were opposed to the gospel and the church of our Lord. They were what are called hostile witnesses. And when they acknowledged as hostile witnesses the empty tomb, they were admitting the reality of a fact that was certainly not in their favor. So why would they admit that the tomb was empty unless the evidence was too strong for them to deny? A doctor, Paul Meyer, calls this positive evidence from a hostile source. In essence, if a source, listen, if a source admits a fact that is decidedly not in its favor, that fact is genuine. And that's a very important point. And if you're going to study history, which is past time and space, and since you can't go back into past time and space to investigate it with your five physical senses, 
then you have to look at the evidence that's come down to us. Now, another. The empty tomb is supported by the historical reliability of the burial story. New Testament scholars, I say, of every stripe, skeptics and all, agree that the burial story is one of the best established facts about Jesus. Now, there's one reason for this. It's because of Joseph of Arimathea is the one who buried Christ in his own unused new tomb. Now, he's not just somebody that jumped out of the bushes and said, I'll find a place for Jesus and nobody knows who in the world he is. Joseph was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. That's more like we see in the King James, of course, called council. It's, it's like a, a spring court. People on this ruling, in this ruling class were too well known, too well known for any fictitious stories about them to be pulled off in this way. Somebody has said regarding all that's preached about Jesus, especially about His resurrection, that these things stood the acid test because there were also all those people around who could have said, it's not so. We were there too. We witnessed that. He said this about that, but I was there, and it's not the way it was. You don't find that when you put together all of the evidence. It's incontrovertible. So they couldn't have circulated a story about him burying Jesus unless it was true. All he would have to say, I don't know what you're talking about. It's not so. Also, if the burial account was legendary, we may have to say more about how legend develops. One would expect to find conflicting traditions which we don't have. It takes, in other words, a long time after an event for a legend to be invented about it. And usually they are come in various colors and stripes, contradict one another. But how does the reliability of Jesus' burial argue that the tomb was empty? Because the burial account of the empty tomb account have grammatical and linguistic ties indicating that they are one continuous account. Therefore, if the burial account is accurate, the empty tomb is likely to be accurate as well. Further, if the burial account is accurate, then everyone knew where Jesus was buried. And this would have been decisive evidence to refute the early Christians who were preaching the resurrection. For if the tomb had not been empty, it would have been evident to all, and the disciples would have been exposed as frauds at worst, are insane at best, and they could have done it rather quickly. But they didn't. And by the way, I'll pause here, since so I happen to know we have a doctoral student here and we have a teacher of history here. Uh, impress upon your students this. This is the reason that you do research and have to document <laughs> what you find. Jesus' tomb, another point, was never venerated as a shrine this is striking for this reason. It was the first century custom to set up a shrine at the side of a holy man's bones. The Jews would bury somebody, the body would decay, the bones were left, and then they would take the bones out and put it in an ossuary. And if he was a real famous somebody, then they would do something to show how important he was. And there were at least 50 such cities or sites, I should say, in Jesus' day. Since there was no such shrine for Jesus, it suggests there weren't any bones to have of Jesus because they were, they were very particular about doing things like this. Another, Mark's account of the empty tomb is simple. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about that legendary. and shows no signs of any kind of development of a legend. This is very apparent when we compare it with the so-called Gospel of Peter, which was a forgery some, appearing some 125 years later, later. This legend has all of the Jewish leaders, Roman guards, and many people from the countryside gathered to watch the resurrection. 
Then three men come out of the tomb with their heads reaching up to the clouds. Then a talking cross comes out of the tomb. Now that's what a legend looks like. And we see none of that in Mark's account of the empty tomb or anywhere else in the gospel accounts. It's just a simple description of a historical fact, that which happened in past time and space. The tomb also was discovered empty. Now, ladies, y'all be real patient about this. By women. Why is that recorded in your Bible? Especially of the women of that day and time, Jewish women of that culture. Because the testimony of women, not only in that culture, but throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, a first century Jewish culture, women especially, was considered worthless. Dr. Craig says if the empty tomb story were a legend, then it is most likely that the male disciples would have been made the first to discover the empty tomb. The fact that despised women whose testimony was deemed worthless were the chief witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb can only be plausibly explained if, like it or not, they actually were the discoverers of the empty tomb. The Bible's factual, folks. You'll remember, by the way, how the disciples treated when they first, those women when they first come in and said, He's risen. It had to be one of those we got to see for ourselves. But that's just the fact of the matter, and that's what makes evidence. Nothing else does. Because of the strong evidence for the empty tomb, then most recent scholars of whatever stripe do not deny it. And that's a very important point. I know you've heard of various theories used to try to explain away the empty tomb, such as the one we mentioned, the body was stolen. Do you realize that you read current literature and for the last many years, there's most of them, even the heretics, <laughs> uh, the skeptics, they, they don't accept those. They actually deride them and laugh at them. They consider them to have been refuted and to be dead arguments and they have for years. For example, here's why. The Jews or Romans had no motive to steal the body. They wanted to suppress Christianity, not encourage it by providing it with an empty tomb. The disciples would have had no motive at all because of their preaching of the resurrection. They were beaten, tortured, killed, and persecuted. Why would they go through all of this for a deliberate lie that they manufactured and knew it was a lie, but told it as the truth and got knocked in the head for it, or worse? No serious scholars hold any of these theories today. Well, what explanation then do the critics offer, if that's on your mind right now, since there are critics? Do you realize that when you pin them down, they are self-confessedly without any explanation to offer except we just can't believe it. There's simply no plausible natural explanation today to account for Jesus' tomb being empty except that Jesus rose from the dead to die no more. The resurrection of Jesus is not just the best explanation for the empty tomb. It is the only explanation for the empty tomb. Now the second point, the resurrection appearances. There is evidence that Jesus' disciples had real experiences with one whom they believed was the risen Christ. I do not think you'll find that this is commonly disputed today because we have the testimony of the original disciples themselves that they saw Jesus alive again. And once you admit that these are true documents of antiquity, then what are you going to do about all of these witnesses? Since anybody studying any part of history, however far back you go, must take 
what is extant and has come down to us. And from that evidence, draw your conclusions. That's done whether you're studying the Revolutionary War or whether you're studying the War of the Roses or whatever it is you're studying. And if you don't need to believe in the reliability of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then there's one more. And you know what's interesting? The heretical critics like him better than they like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the fellow's known as the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, Paul writing to the church in Corinth to correct their abuses and misuses of the doctrine of the resurrection. Listen to him. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And notice what He does immediately. Because remember, He saw the risen Lord, but He wasn't there at the time of Christ's ministry and His suffering and His death on the cross and His actual being viewed by the other apostles after the Lord rose. And He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Well, some are falling asleep, they're dead. After that he was seen of James, then all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Why is that in your Bible? Why did God say, I want that in the Bible? I want that for everybody until the end of time to read. I want them to learn something from it. What the scholars of every kind think about this is that this material, if you notice the people that he referred to were people that were there were eyewitnesses, that this was actually a saying. And the rhyme scheme of it was designed to help people who couldn't read to be able to recite that very thing as to what really happened. In fact, there's a music to it. For I delivered unto you first of all that which you also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred. Brethren, that's what helps you. That's an aid when they didn't have modern-day aids to help you memorize now, I told the brethren here earlier, when we have our children come down here, little ones, and we sing once a month, then we do things like that. And that's the reason those little songs are written the way they are. They're designed for little kids that can't read, but they can learn it. And I guarantee you, most of our little ones, from say eight on down, though some have begun to read, they can sing Sister Laura Laycook's in the Bible we find Dorcas was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. She was sick and then died, and the widows all cried until Peter kneeled down on the floor. Let me ask you something. Is that true? Did that really happen? Is that an actual historical fact? Of course it is. It's the way those people at that time had of teaching on the level of those folks, and especially even adults when they can't read. It's so a way they can remember it. Scholars think this is exactly what Christ picked, or rather Paul picked up from the early church members before he ever became a member, which makes it then a rather early piece of material. Now that's the way scholars look at it, and they're not concerned about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So remember that. We're looking at it like historians look at it. So it's generally agreed by critical scholars that Paul received this creed at some point. Now we understand he's inspired of the Holy Spirit. We know that. But there were things that happened before he came into the church of which with his eyes he did not witness. And yet he wrote about them and some things he writes right here he did not see. 
Now I want you to show, I want to show, how it is that one who was there through it all, how he would write. And it's just like Paul wrote there. Listen to John writing to Christians many years later in 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, now listen, which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For this life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen, and heard, declare we unto you. Why? That ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ, and these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21. And who wrote that? The Apostle Paul to the church. When the New Testament was still being written, it wasn't all completed. Now I recognize that just because the disciples think they saw Jesus doesn't automatically mean they really did but that means there are three possible alternatives we mentioned one they were lying they were hallucinating and you know what the third one is they really saw Jesus Christ raised from the dead now which of these are most likely were they lying well on this view the disciples knew that Jesus had not really risen if that had been the case but they made up this story about the resurrection. They knew it was false. They preached it as the truth. And then look what happened to them. But they just kept on preaching it. Why did ten of the disciples willingly die as martyrs, as far as we know, for their belief in the resurrection if it was a lie? And they started it. And they knew it was a lie. People will often die for a lie that they believe to be the truth. But if Jesus did not rise, the disciples knew it. Thus, they wouldn't have just been dying for a lie that they mistakenly believed was true. As I said two or three times already, they would have been dying for a lie that they knew was a lie because they made it up. Because then of the absurdity of the theory that the disciples were lying, we can see, and this may surprise you, why almost all scholars of every stripe today admit that, if nothing else, the disciples at least believe that Jesus appeared to them. Now, I understand it's, it's like a lot of folks when you're teaching the truth about the existence of God. Uh, they may not believe it, though they can't answer it, because to believe it means they've got to do a lot of radical, radical changing in their life, of which they are not willing to do. So even when they can't answer these things, uh, and they have to admit them, that doesn't mean they're going to change. Remember, the Lord did as well as anybody could do, which means you couldn't do any better. And he didn't reach a lot of people, but we call him the master teacher. We know that just believing something to be true doesn't make it true. So perhaps the disciples were wrong and had been deceived by hallucination. The hallucination theory is untenable because it cannot explain the physical, physical, I say, nature of our Lord's appearances. There's a reason that you find the Lord eating and drinking with His disciples. There's a reason, John says, we touched Him. We saw Him with our own eyes. We handled Him. Remember what Jesus told Thomas? Unless I can put my hands into these wounds of the crucifixion, I'll not believe Jesus all of a sudden appears there. He says, Thomas, put your hands here and here. What Thomas do? Always makes me, now here's a real reason to shiver a little bit. Fell down before him and said, my Lord and my God. And that's what an honest heart with evidence, credible evidence and witnesses responds to. Now this can't be done with hallucinations. Second, it's highly unlikely that they would all have the same hallucinations. <laughs> hallucinations are highly individual and not group projects. Imagine if I came in here tonight and said to you, wasn't that dream I had last night great? 
And I know what I'd think of you if you came in and asked me that. Hallucination-like dreams generally don't transfer like that. Further, the hallucination theory cannot explain the conversion of Paul three, we think, I say we think, years later, at least quite a while later from the time of the actual resurrection. Paul, persecutor of Christians, you think he was looking forward to saying, I'm looking for the resurrected Christ. There's no indication that Paul, who said he breathed out threatening and slaughter and all the things he said he did to Christians, that he was looking for the Christ. He considered it a false thing. But he was converted apart from the disciples who were there and saw the resurrected Lord shortly after his resurrection. Perhaps most significantly, the hallucination theory cannot even deal with the evidence of the empty tomb. So you can grant them hallucination. Now what are you going to do about the empty tomb? Since the disciples could have been lying or hallucinating, we have only, they could not have been doing that. We have only one explanation left. The disciples believed that they had seen the risen Jesus because they really had. That's exactly what a witness is. So the resurrection appearances alone demonstrate the resurrection. Thus, if we reject the resurrection, listen, we're left with a second inexplicable mystery. First, the empty tomb, and now the appearances. What are you going to do about that? Since you've admitted that they're credible, historical evidence having happened in past time and space and come down to us through books of antiquity like anything else pertaining to Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or your great uncle Fufu. Have you ever found letters from a great grandfather or what? I have a letter that uh, still bears the stamp on it. This will just thrill Jerry. I know it will before I ever say it. It's written to one of the Todds who married into uh, our family and my grandmother's real mother died then her father married a woman whose name was Todd and this all came into the family this way and it's a letter written in 1866 now mind you the Civil War ended back in 1865 so it's obvious somebody's still honoring certain stamps because the stamp on that letter over a year over a year after the Civil War ended is a stamp of Jefferson Davis with his image on it of the Confederacy. Somebody's still honoring something, and I've got something come down to me that is absolute proof that I can show you they did because it was mailed once the states were always already back in the Union, and somebody still allowed that stamp to carry it through in 1866. That's studying history. That's what we're talking about. Now, quickly. The origin of the Christian faith. That's our, our last point. The existence of the Lord's church is strong proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, why is that the case? Because even the most skeptical New Testament scholars admit that the disciples at least believed that Jesus was raised from the grave. But how can we explain the origin of that belief? Well, Dr. William Lane Craig points out that there were three possible causes. Christian influences, pagan influences, or Jewish influences. Well, could it have been Christian influences? Well, since the belief in the resurrection was itself the foundation of the Lord's church of Christianity, it cannot be explained as a later product of Christianity. It's the foundation on which... Christianity begins. Further, as we saw, if the disciples made it up, then they were frauds and liars. Alternatives we have shown to be false. We have also shown the unlikeliness that they hallucinated this belief. Well, what about pagan influences? Isn't it often pointed out that there were many myths of dying and rising Savior gods at the time of Christianity? Couldn't the disciples have been deluded by these myths and just copied them down into their own teaching on the resurrection of Christ? Do you realize, in reality, serious scholars have almost universally rejected this theory since World War II? 
And there's several reasons they did. First, it's been shown that these mystery religions had no major influence in Palestine in the first century. Second, most of the sources which contain parallels originated after Christianity was established. And third, most of the similarities are often apparent and not real, which is a result of sloppy terminology on the part of those who explain them. For example, one critic tried to argue that a ceremony of killing a bull and letting the blood drip all over the participants was parallel to Holy Communion. Now, you know, when I ran across this in dealing with this topic, I remembered from my studies in Roman history that when the Roman soldiers in the late Republic and before it became the Empire went over under Agrippa, and actually Pompey, into the East, then those Romans who had their own religions and pantheon of gods, basically the same as the Greeks, got over there in the East and ran across these Eastern doctrines, these Eastern religions, and they were, like people are today, fascinated at something new. And so they adopted all this, and what we read here is one of the things they adopted. So I wondered, how did somebody come up with that and try to put it into this? The other thing is, is that the early disciples were Jews. That's not hard to see. It would have been unthinkable for a Jew to borrow from another religion. Just read Acts 10, and look how Peter thought it. It's already been referred to, we're off. You know, Peter said to Cornelius, it's unlawful for a man, of another, a Jew is a Jew, to go into a man of another nation. They were zealous in their belief that the pagan religions were abhorrent to God. Jewish influences cannot explain the belief in the resurrection. Now we're back to what I read earlier. Martha didn't understand the resurrection like Jesus went through. She believed in a general resurrection. First century Judaism had no conception of a single individual rising from the dead in the middle of history not to die anymore. Their concept was also that everybody would be raised together, as I said at the end. So the idea of one individual rising in the middle of history was foreign to them. And just look at the disciples' viewpoint when the Lord taught them over and over again about it. They didn't grasp it. And his own family didn't believe on him till he rose from the dead. That's not just in your Bible to take up space, folks. There's information there. So Judaism of that day could have never produced the resurrection hypothesis. This is a, another good argument against the theory that the disciples were hallucinating. Psychologists, by the way, tell us that hallucinations cannot contain anything new. That is, they cannot contain any idea that isn't already somehow in your mind. I thought it was interesting. He said, these fellows dreaming up something what we would call a nightmare because they had something siring on their stomach. And I promise you it would have been a nightmare, maybe something grotesque, but it's always built around what's real. Since the early disciples were Jews, they had no conception of the Messiah rising from the dead. They, couldn't, they just couldn't believe their Messiah would even be killed, much less rise from the dead in the middle of history. Thus, they would have never hallucinated about a resurrected Christ. At best, they would have hallucinated that he had been transported directly to heaven. And that's exactly what people who weren't inspired said about the prophet Muhammad. So we see that if the resurrection did not happen, there's no plausible way to account for the origin of the church of Christ. We would be left with a third inexplicable, inexplicable mystery. Now, as we bring it down to a close, these are three independently established facts that we have noticed. If we deny the resurrection, we are left with at least three inexplicable mysteries. But there's a much, much better explanation than a wimpy appeal to the mystery of a far-fetched appeal to a stolen body hallucination and mystery religion. You know what that best explanation is? It's the fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth rose from the dead to die no more. Amen. If we take each fact by itself, we have good enough evidence. But taken together, we see that the evidence becomes even stronger. And that's a very important point. Time is away from us, and there's a lot more involved in this study. But the best explanation seems to be that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead to die no more, which means that he suffered on the cross, bled, and died, and was buried, which means he came to this world just like John, by inspiration, wrote. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. Then it comes down to verse 14, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when they stood there that day looking up as a cloud receded out of their sight, they were told by heavenly messengers, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And then they were told he'll come in like manner. And then they went out to tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would endow them as the apostles, ambassadors of the court of heaven to do what Christ called them to do. And after that, they were different men. They gave their witness to the resurrection of Christ and the Holy Spirit permitted them with signs and wonders to show that God was delivering the message of salvation, the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. Brethren, we have no reason to have our faith shaken. When fairly examined, nothing can stand against Jesus Christ. Let us rise up as one man, though the world reject it all. And let us declare to the world what the Bible says is true concerning Jesus Christ in every way. And let us be as John, who said we don't know what we're going to be like, but we'll be like Him when we see Him as He is. Beloved, do you are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of His power. But then He comes around and says, but He's coming to be glorified in those who hold to the facts of the gospel and live as the New Testament teaches them to live. Our hope is not in vain, because Jesus is not vanity. I leave you inviting you to obey the gospel if you have not done so, or if your faith has wavered as a child of God, to consider it, repent of whatever it is that's sinful, come confessing it, and pray that you be forgiven. An invitation encourages you to act upon the evidence offered in the word preached, and that we do now, begging you to come to Jesus in obedience to the gospel while we stand and sing. <laughs>